If you're an agency and you're thinking, I feel my days being numbered, I feel things getting harder, I feel people asking me for stuff that we don't provide or isn't a part of our lines of service, I'm gonna go counter to every narrative I've ever espoused in the history of my agency coaching. And I've coached hundreds, if not thousands of agencies at this point. And it used to be all about building processes, procedures, scale, telling people what you do and you don't do. And that is over. What you really need as a business is you need an agency that's built like SEAL Team 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and can deploy the specific SEAL Team based upon your specific needs and connect you with resources that are specific because that's what your problems are. Hello and welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is your host, Ralph Burns, and this is the show where we share cutting edge strategies on acquiring leads and sales so you can achieve your vision as an organization. And today's topic, Kasim, I'm pretty excited about because I feel this is going to be a bit controversial, but that is... We have to take a stand. We're going to burn here. some bridges today. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna piss some people off here today because I think there is something that I have certainly seen in the last, I would say more so the last six months, but coming on the last couple of years is just this hatred of agencies. Yep. You know, and just dissatisfaction with the agency model, the old agency model, and how agencies price, how they work, how they sell, and what worked so long ago and the reason why so many of these things sprung up, myself and you included, were a part of this, right? And at last count, there was 42,100 agencies, although the last report I saw was closer to like 38,000. So there's a lot of consolidation happening because it was too many that came out of the pandemic, is my opinion. Because all you need is a laptop mm. and a little knowledge of Facebook or Google or whatever, you know, a snappy PowerPoint presentation at a conference and boom, you got an agency. And you know who I'm talking about. So we're going to be talking about the death of the agency here today. And I know you love controversy and you love to take a stand. Today is that day that we are going to be doing exactly that. So I'm pretty excited. I'm excited for you, Ralph. I feel like this is your moment specifically to, I don't know, eat some crow maybe because you're the one that created half of those 42,000 agencies <laughs> or little tier 11 carbon copies that came out of all your education. So mm -hmm. in a world where we assign guilt and blame, mm -hmm. this is your fault. You created the majority of these little, you know, uh, me too agencies. Yeah. I blame I, you. I uh, yeah, yeah. I would say, and Sean Clark is to blame too. I, I'm gonna, Sean I'm Clark gonna... is to blame for so many things. <laughs> There's so it's... many things that we can peg Sean with, dude. Sean is the is the murderer of so many software businesses, applications. Like the, I mean, you want to talk about the Robin Hood of the software world? Yeah. He took like all of the software oligarchs and just annihilated, annihilated their businesses. Them. Yeah. 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 He did. He did a good job. This is obviously the CEO of. I never know if it's go high level or high level. It's technically it's high level, but that was, that was just a bad domain decision that they went with. Just a bad, just a bad yeah. domain. Dude, decision. imagine that. They have like the yeah. worst domain in the world. They're still the most successful software still company I've successful. ever seen in my entire life. Yeah. That yeah. was crazy. It's crazy because he enabled agencies to be able to like pull in leads and really cultivate them and sell sell them. I mean, the Dude, idea he gave of all the monetization to the agencies. Yeah, hundred percent. It's insane. So I, I think he and I take a lot of the blame for it. I'm going to blame other people like, you know, Eric Huberman, because just he's like wildly successful and he just yeah. has done such a good job of just promoting the idea he's of an not agency. really an agency though. If you look at Hawks, I mean, he has a hundred million dollars a year in gross revenue. You can't do that with an agency model. He's a staffing well, company. He said on our podcast, it was 500 million in revenue. I was like, wow. Was it really? That's oh yeah! I remember when he said that. I was like, "Congratulations on your five hundred million dollar valuation." He's like, "Ah, oh, that's revenue." So could it be that means he's from, got a hat? What do you think the valuation is on that? I would say they're if they are five hundred million in revenue. Yeah, that means they are EBITDA or earnings of a hundred million is my guess at the very least, and that has got to be a thirty or a forty x. Right, but it, dude, even if it's a ten x, that's a billion dollars. It's a billion, yeah, yeah. There's, even I mean, and, and there's no way he gets a ten x. Like he'd have to get much higher than a ten x. Oh, he would get twenty, thirty x on that multiple. Yeah. So, but but this idea, like this, is one of the ideas why so many agencies started, is because you can get this 
thing called multiple expansion. Greg Smith came on the show, talked about it. We'll leave links in the show notes if you want to go back to that about how you value companies. The point is, is that you know, digital marketing agencies just in general, there's way too many of them and most of them suck, mm-hmm. but they can still sell for a pretty multiple if they do it right. Uh, or they can just keep, be consolidated and just, you know, stock swap, partner with other agencies, do all that. But the model itself, I think, has fundamentally shifted. So we're going to get into that here today just quickly and how that's changed and what our view of that is. One of the big things, and this is sort of the nugget for today, if you did not see this, this came out uh, a little less than three weeks ago. I think it's one of the biggest news on the Meta platforms, and we'll leave a link in the show notes for this, uh, where Meta is now letting Amazon shoppers buy products on Facebook and Instagram without leaving the app. This is a big, big deal. And this is terrifying to me. The fact that we're giving Amazon more real estate, like, I mean, dear God in heaven, those people are going to own all of e-com. Yeah. Well, I, I, I read an article this weekend, and the reason why I was like, geez, we'd never have mentioned this on the show, is that Amazon is doing, well, Amazon does what Amazon does. It just, it operates... According to Jeff Bezos, he gets up every day thinking he's a startup. So he's just going to be as aggressive as possible every single day, which is kind of cool, actually, when you really think about it. But, man, he'd be tough to work for. Um, the point is, is that there is a lot well, of I know somebody that worked for him. Yeah. And in, I know but, somebody who worked for him really closely. She was she was one person removed from him, and she had to go through a three-week – this is an absolutely true story. Three-week – it might have been four weeks, but it was definitely three-week training on how to email Jeff, specific – Workflows, processes, nomenclature, and it, you did—you could not screw it up, or it was over. Three weeks in a hyper efficiency, a hyper efficient, like three weeks of content, Ralph. Yeah. That's you know, 120 hours of content on how to email this man. Like they are cyborgs over there. It's cyborgs. unreal, unbelievable. And I think they're being—I never know how to pronounce it, but I see their ads everywhere. They are now being challenged by at least two big Chinese companies. Timu, Timu, Timu. Is that a, Timu. Yeah, dude, I, I've spent way too much money on Timu. I buy, I buy shit on Timu. It's like, why does anybody need that? But it's, it's, you know, it's like this is ninety cents. I'm actually looking at this thing. I've got this. If you're watching the video, go to perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. There's this little handy phone, smartphone cleaner, like, and and or, and you know, this is a keyboard cleaner, like device cleaner. Ralph, there's no reason for me to have this thing, but it was on Timu and it just looks so cool. And I don't know, I, I think it was a dollar. Like it's uh, it's an unbelievable business model that Timu has. And I've never seen a more convertible app in my life. If you want to study CRO, if you really want to know good, good, good CRO, go download Timu. And I dare you to try not to buy something. You can't do it. Yeah. I, I read that it is the most downloaded app in the US and then a bunch of other EU countries like this year in 2023. Yeah. So, I mean, it's taken off. And so Amazon obviously sees this as a potential threat. So why not partner with big companies like Facebook in order to have this enablement? Uh, this is this is a big deal right here. And like I said, if you haven't heard about it, you may or may not have seen it in your ad accounts. I have not seen it as of yet, but uh, I haven't asked my team just in the last week. Like we've been talking about it a lot. We haven't actually seen it as of yet, and um, pretty exciting to have that. And the question is, is how well are you going to be able to track? I can't wait to find that out because right now the the Amazon conversion. Why would you track perfectly? You should it's be in-app able to track. Facebook first party, in-app Amazon first party. Wouldn't that be a perfect one hundred percent attribution? Yes, but I'm not assuming. There's no data on that. There's no news on that as of yet that yeah. I have seen. So I mean, it would take the participation the case, of both those entities, but in this particular instance, just in this microcosm, it it behooves them both. I mean, I know that we're facing like the iron curtain of corporate firewalls or whatever, but I think they both want to pass it back and forth. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to assume that a conversion pixel is going to fire and you're going to find out like what you're selling on Amazon right now. It's a bit of a black hole. Like we all know people see something on Facebook, they Google it on Google and then they go check the price on Amazon 
If you don't that's all under, I I've if never you don't understand that. Yet. I have explained yeah. that to businesses like in a whiteboard and they're like, "Huh? Wait a second. No, they just click on the Facebook ad and people they buy. have free will." I'm like, yeah. I'm like, humans and, are autonomous agents that don't do exactly what I tell them to do. And on many occasions, I've looked at their Amazon. They have so many other offers on Amazon because they don't manage their Amazon offers, which is such a big part of success on Amazon. Is like that there's offers for a fraction of a cost that you can buy on their actual site. So why the hell would anybody, especially everybody has Prime, why would you even mm. buy it on your actual site if you can get it on Amazon the next day, maybe a sample size, some way to test it out? People just don't get that. And I think that you know the perpetual traffic listener would like to think that they understand that, but I assume sometimes too much. So the point is, is there is a black hole that exists with Facebook and Google and the ultimate conversion that's being shown through Amazon. There are some sort of third-party tracking platforms that do model it, as we know. Uh, how accurate that is, eh, you know, like we should Not have John Moran on this call <laughs> on this show once again to go through all that because it still is a black hole. The point is, is to have it actually inside the app and to actually create your conversion with tracking. This is going to be a game changer. Yeah. I'm excited and also terrified. The increased efficacy excites me, but the over-reliance of Amazon. I mean, dude, Amazon's taking 15% at a minimum. Minimum. Mm. At a minimum. And sometimes it's it's more. Sometimes it's 20 or 30, depending on like the fulfillment architecture and the way that you're set up and storage and all that other stuff. Sure. There's, there's no margin left. You know, like store owners are, are being squeezed. And then Amazon turns around and says, wow, your little, you know, doohickey selling real well. Why don't I just go manufacture that myself? Right. Because now I have all the data on all Dude, your I know what things. titles work, what descriptions work, what pictures work, what sells, how much it sells for. And, and they can buy better than we can buy, produce better than we can produce, ship better than we can ship. Of They're just going to own the world. And there's And you almost, dude, I admire it. Yeah. I'm watching this happen, you know, and I'm just like, you won. You did this. This is amazing. It's yeah. unbelievable. But yeah, it's just like, oh, wow. I mean, that yeah. guy, if you look at what he really pulled off, it's it's magic. It It's frightening on one side, but you got to respect it on the other. Just how yeah. it creates it's like the monolith. The new. Oh. It's like, I can't believe that you guys did that. That's really cool, by the way. Also, stop. Yeah. Stop here now. You know what I mean? Like, we don't need, you know, stop producing warheads. Just don't do it. Yeah. Well, it might yeah. be why, you know, the whole Sam Altman thing happened with OpenAI because he was that guy who said, wait a second, we got to stop. This could be. Dude, I control. love him. Yeah. yeah. He's my favorite person, I think, it, that exists in the corporate world. If there was a human that we needed to put in charge of the creation of something that could potentially destroy humanity, it would be Sam Altman. He's yeah. so conscientious and yeah. thoughtful and smart. And he understands not just the technology, he also understands people. And, and the way that those two things would interface. I, I've listened to every interview I get my hands on with him, and I've just yeah. never been more impressed with anybody. I hope this ages well, you know, because 18 months from now, he could just turn into Mussolini or who knows what. But um, so far, he's been a paragon of excellence. Yeah. And I love yeah, that it, it was five days that they, you know, tried to oust him. And like all of, all of OpenAI was like, well, we're out. I think it was a couple hundred employees that just jumped ship. Ninety-five percent of employees wanted to jump ship. Like, if really? that isn't leadership, I think it was like they had seven hundred fifty people and seven hundred signed that petition that said, "I am gone," and they were all going to go to 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 Microsoft. Microsoft, yeah. Which is basically, I mean, Microsoft. I know they don't, but they more or less own OpenAI anyway. So the work would have continued just under a different banner. Yeah. It's an amazing. Yeah, and dude, good on here. Microsoft for staying relevant. That was an AOL Time Warner if I've ever seen one. Microsoft was done. They were just like, rest on your laurels. You have billions of dollars. You built the you know corporate infrastructure for all things internet, and you haven't innovated in twenty years. And here they go coming up from behind, you know. And now all of a sudden they're they're at the vanguard again. They're at the bleeding edge. I think Satya Nadella, who's the CEO of Microsoft, yeah. is, is brilliant. Like he put that whole thing together as soon as the Sam Altman stuff broke on that Friday. He put it all together by Sunday. Like he had 
Sam Altman inside Fixed. Microsoft. Like, talk about acting. Yeah, fast. he promoted him to CEO of Microsoft AI. Being smart, like he just acted so quickly. And yeah. the, I, from what I've read, like the Microsoft employees were all like, "Oh my God, this guy is." After years of just being sort of this, you know, lumpy old doldrummy, you know, fat corporate software company, now they're back in the cutting edge. Yeah. I mean, they have really. This is like good to great, back to mediocre, like we always sort of talk about, and back, <laughs> yeah. and they're back onto like this great curve again because they have gotten out ahead of what we think, you and I, a hundred percent. Which we're gonna have to do a whole show on on you know the future of digital marketing just for AI, just in general. Oh, um, we have to. But but like there is so much a part of what we're gonna be doing today, and just a part of humanity. Forget about like the digital marketing side; it's just one small part of it. You know, like what, what what we've seen with Chat GPT and helping copywriting is the tip of the tip of the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more. It's actually so. irrelevant to the discussion at this point. Like it's moved yeah. so quickly and it's yeah. so commonplace. I mean, I've never seen anything just become woven into the fabric of our collective understanding so fast that I'm bored of it. You know, I mean, it's 12 days yeah. old and I'm bored of talking about chat GPT for copy. It's like, yeah, dude, of course. But have you tried? Of course. I have full blown conversations, which I brainstorm with chat GPT. Right. Like it's a buddy. Yeah. You know, it might be one of my closest friends, Ralph. If I'm being really honest with myself right now, like nobody else talks back to me the way it does or it listens or. It loves you. Yeah. I do like it actually Bard. Well, I'm using Bard a whole I know lot you do. More. I love that about you. I, I really yeah. appreciate that of you, that you would come over to the Google side. Oh, I, I'm I'm platform solution agnostic. agnostic. I'm yeah. solutions agnostic. You Too only much. have eight solutions at Solutions Eight. I'll, I have. I don't even have that infinite. anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a good segue. If had <laughs> I had eight segue. solutions, yeah, we we would have probably survived this storm a little bit better. Yeah, and maybe uh, things would be a little bit different. All right, so we are going to get into the real portion of the show about where we think the future of agencies are going. And you're not going to like what we're going to have to say here. So before we actually go to break, super important, we haven't mentioned this in a show or two, we are still offering a pretty darn good deal for Traffic and Conversion Summit. You want to tell our listeners what that's all about, Kasim, if they haven't heard about it already? Yeah. So if you haven't been to Traffic and Conversion, it's the, the largest, in my, my opinion, the best marketing conference in North America, maybe the world. And I've been to, I, I can actually say that with some integrity because I've been to a ton of marketing conferences worldwide, both as an attendee and a speaker. Uh, the best speakers by far, the best content and the attendee, like the class of attendees, unbelievable. So great networking, great parties, great fun. Um, it's not just a, a, an ego fest either. It's all very actionable. And we're giving away a ticket. Now, the tickets right now are on sale for $1,995. Uh, on December 14th, that goes up to $2,600, $2,595. So this is $2,000 value. And we're going to give it to one lucky listener. All you have to do to enter is write a review, an honest review about perpetual traffic. And we're going to take everybody who submitted a review and we're going to choose them at random. Mm -hmm. uh, we will like you more personally if you write us a nice review, but the review just needs to be honest. And we will choose one of the reviews at random and that person will get the ticket. But the, the requirement, my ask is, I don't know if I'm allowed to require this, like what the FTC rules are as far as giving it away. But my, my ask is, that you actually go. Because if you're just going to sell it, mm. you know, like, don't do that. Don't. Save it for somebody who's actually going to write a review and, and is going to attend because there's so much value in being an attendee. Yeah. And the other thing that we'll do, and I haven't talked to Ralph about this, so Ralph, I'm volunteering you. Mm -hmm. uh, if you win this ticket, uh, come hang out with me and Ralph. We'll take a picture. We'll do a quick little, you know, uh, reel or whatever. Put it up on the socials. Make you nerd famous on traffic, on uh, uh, Perpetual Traffic's YouTube. That's right. Sounds good. Maybe we'll, you know, throw in a beer or two there. I don't know. But yeah. Uh, yeah, we will We will figure that out. We will connect with you and we will get together at Traffic and Conversion Summit. And uh, that's a huge value. It's a big deal. It's the best conference. It's, uh, I have numerous mem team members that are going. If I could invite everybody, I would. But the point is, is like it's a must, must see event. And it's happening in uh, January in Las Vegas. Las, Las Vegas for the first time. Viva so, Las Vegas. Viva Las Vegas. Yeah. So uh, make sure that you do um, uh, leave that review, that honest review, wherever it may be. And we will randomly pick you or whoever 
uh, we randomly choose. I don't know who's going to be choosing a Cosm, me or you. We're just going to blindly we'll do just, a little spindly wheel. You know, spindly wheel, yeah, based yeah. upon the names and so forth. So definitely get uh, get involved in that. So uh, we are going to get into the future of agencies. Uh, and if you're an agency, this isn't very good news for you right after this quick break. All right, Takasum, you have sold your agency. <laughs> I did, but I'm still CEO. Like I'm still, still CEO behind the wheel. Now I'm an employee, Ralph. That's a, it's a, if for any entrepreneur that's ever made that shift, it's, it's weird to say the least. Yeah. It's been a, it's been an interesting transition to see it happening yeah. from my side as to how you've responded to it. But I think one of the things that prompted you to make that decision a year and a half or so ago. October 2022. Yeah. October 2022. Okay. So it really was just about a year ago. Well, that's was, when we closed on the deal. But mm. I mean, you know, it took most of 2022 to get the deal done. The offer right. came in, I think, in January or something, if memory serves. So one of the big reasons why you left or why you decided to exit the space, was it because of the direction that you see the industry going or was it, I mean, I know there was obviously, there's always personal reasons as to why someone does something like this. But I think I remember a conversation that we had as related to today's subject that you weren't really happy with the way that things were going. On a long enough timeline, I knew for a fact that our days were numbered and it was Performance Max that convinced me of it. You, you look at Google Performance Max and you, you said, here's my goal here's my creative. And by the way, you don't create the creative. It's like, here are the building blocks to my creative. You don't even have to give it an audience. You don't even tell it the target. And then you say, go. And, and Pmax did it. And I realized it's only going to take, I don't know what, five years before you say, here's my URL, here's my credit card, go. And you don't need an agency to do those things. And, and actually, I was, I was preparing for an exit, but the offer that we took came in unsolicited. And the reason I chose, I, we, we sold to a company called Pixis, um, brilliant young folks that built this AI suite. And we sold to them specifically because it, it was the AI that really captivated me. That's what I knew we were going to need in order to stay ahead. And I thought, well, gosh, you know, here's this little business that I built that I still love. I still love these people. I still love my clients. And the best chance we had at increased longevity was jumping on the AI bandwagon. And what's funny is, I, and I, this is the first time in my life this has ever been true, Ralph, so I'm not being arrogant. But I was exactly right. And it happened way faster than I thought it would. We've lost more clients in the last 90 days than we have in the last two years combined. And here's what's crazy about those client losses. I'm getting love letters from them on their way out. Hey, you guys are amazing. We've never had a better relationship. Maybe we'll be back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But between people tightening their belts, A, but more importantly, People refiguring, reconfiguring how their advertising is done. That's why I'm losing these clients. They no longer want the specialist in one field. Mm -hmm. Now what they want is an agency, freelancer, entity, or employee, or a group of employees that can do a myriad of things because it's all become so intertwined and entangled. And it's not enough that we're the best Google Ads agency in the world, because we are. That's the other thing. Like, I will die on that hill. I dare somebody to come and go up, you know, toe to toe with John Moran. Uh, you know, if, if we could really build the control center and show, like, you know, all things being equal, we will annihilate you. But we don't do enough as an agency. And, and because of it, we're losing clients. Now, I'm correcting, we're course correcting, and we're going to bring on lines of service, and we're going to expand back off into. Uh, a broader, more full funnel agency, but that's also not the answer because it's not, it's not enough to just do more services. And this is why we're jumping on this agency is dead bandwagon. 
the agency model is built around delivering a templatized solution. That's a fact. If you're an agency, you have a proven and proprietary process. That's what everybody sells. You might use different words, but that's what everybody sells. The templatized solution cannot work any longer in this environment where data has been removed and needs to be captured in an ultra specific way that's hyper dependent upon who the business is, what their industry is, what their tech stack is, who their competitors are, where they are geographically, et cetera, where offerings are different, competitive landscapes are different, customers are different, um, ad channels are different. There is no template for any client. Even clients in the same industry, there's no template that really plays pair pursue. You might have co-centric circles even, but you know, one is going to, they're going to, one's going to shrink and one's going to expand. And, and the amount of overlap is, is diminishing by the day. And so even for agencies that have broader service lines, you're probably not in as much trouble as I'm in at the moment. And we'll survive this, by the way. I have no concerns whatsoever because we're nimble and we're entrepreneurial. But it's an important thing to be honest about. Even if you have additional service lines, if you're selling templated solutions, you're selling something that the market has no place for. And businesses are waking up to that so fast it's not funny. The only way to survive is to build something that allows for truly custom, truly bespoke implementation on behalf of every individual client. And by the way, what I just said is the least scalable model in the world. So you should be, as an agency owner, you should be repelled by what I'm saying. This isn't the type of thing that can scale, but that's why businesses are going away from agencies because businesses no longer want to be put inside of a, a they don't want to be on an assembly line. There's, they don't want to be just another cadaver on your table getting cut open the same way you've done every single other business prior to. It doesn't work anymore. And so businesses are getting nimble and they're sewing together their own teams, bringing in house, using freelancers. The best, most successful relationships that I'm seeing uh, are the ones where businesses have strong, strong interaction with solo or, or duo, uh, providers, you know, like this one person who's like amazing at CRO has 10 clients that he does a deep, 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 he or she does a deep, deep, deep dive on and knows those clients inside out, upside down, left, right and center. And then also gets a little expansive from there. And so, you know, if you're a business and you're feeling this pain, if you're feeling like, man, I just can't find an agency that understands me, it's because they don't, because they can't. Because their model doesn't work that way. Because they're an assembly line. And if you're an agency and you're thinking, you know, I, I feel my days being numbered. I feel things getting harder. I feel people asking me for stuff that, you know, we don't provide or isn't a part of our lines of service. I'm going to go counter to every narrative I've ever espoused in the history of my agency coaching. And I've coached hundreds, if not thousands of agencies at this point. I was digital marketers elite coach for their agency program. And it used to be all about building processes, procedures, scale, telling people what you do and you don't do. And that is over. What you really need as a business is you need an agency that's built like SEAL Team 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 and can deploy the specific SEAL Team based upon your specific needs and connect you with resources that are specific. Mm -hmm. You notice I used the word specific 19 times in this conversation, Ralph? Mm -hmm. Like specific, bespoke, custom, because that's what your problems are. Mm -hmm. And the solutions need to be that too. So I realized that was really ranty, but that's what we promised people. So I'm going to pause there and see if you have pushback, agreement, or more to say. I'm going to simplify it a bit. <laughs> I bet I, you everybody I, would appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> Especially me. I'm very like, I've been called non-journey, very results. Like just give me the bottom line. I look at it two different ways. We operated, and I think a lot of agencies operated under a product first model. Mm. Hey, you know, you're coming to us for Facebook ads. We'll sell you Facebook ads. Oh, you say you want Google ads, we'll sell you Google ads. And that's the way most agencies operate. Flipping that around is the is what the future of the agency world is all about because it's not about a product anymore. It's about being what we call client centric. It's about understanding what the need is and applying the solution in a way in which ad spend has nothing to do with it anymore. We do not, no longer do we charge by ad spend. Now we have some legacy clients that are, are on that model. The point is, is that anyone who is new that comes in, we sell them based upon what is important to them 
and their business, our understanding of what's best for their business, and flip the script in what we refer to as a user story. And mm. the user story is one of the things that our COO, who you've met, uh, implemented within Tier 11, and it's been transformative for us because now the process of onboarding is all, it's not about what, what hammer we can use to hammer in the nail. It's about whether or not we should be using a nail at all. Should we be using a nail? Should we be using a screw? Should we be using a hex bolt? What well, and the expectation that it might change. Maybe it I do need to change. hammer in this nail, but then when the nail is done, maybe it is a screw that comes after this. And dude, that's such an important point because 100%. so many agencies, you do need the nail hammered in. Absolutely. Sure. Once. Sure. And then when that's done, do we need to keep doing nails or should we move no. on to, you know, what is it that we're building? What's the goal? What's the long term? What's the next thing? So for us, what's the next, yeah, what's the next yeah. step? And it's also utilizing so, so much more, like we have basically three ways in which we can do creative. Creative typically is, uh, for a lot of agencies, it's a one size fits all. You either do it this way or you don't. And, but now we have three different ways in which we can, which we can interact with a customer or now a client. We even change the name of who we deal with. And I'll, mm. tell, I'll get to that in just a second with customized solutions so that, and we've elongated the sales process. We used to just be like, oh, come in, we'll do an audit, Facebook ads, boom, let's start. This is what you're going to pay every single month and that's it. Productize it. And this is the way that I started tier 11. I said, all right, I want to be like the Henry Ford of the agency space and productized everything. And the reason why we called our clients customers is because they paid in advance, right? And Everything that we did was templatized. It was, oh, you want this playbook? That one applies to you. That playbook, and then we don't change it. We did the same playbook month in, month out, regardless of what their real needs are. And we flipped this completely. And the reason why is that we were such a media buying centric company. We looked at everything through a media buying lens. It was all about, oh, well, the, the, the way to solve your problems is through more ad spend on Meta, more spend mm. on Facebook, more on Instagram. Maybe like then we added in Google, then we added in or after the click, then we added in email. But we looked at it in product centric ways as opposed to what's best for the client. And it is completely shifted how we work with our customers. So now what used to take just a couple of weeks to bring somebody on and then obviously onboard them, it might take three to four weeks, if not longer in some cases, because we need to understand before we even engage, before we even, you know, start pressing any buttons, like what their real goals are. Because I interviewed some, some customers who left us and we were hitting their KPIs. We were doing great. Like we were doing all the things we were supposed to be doing. And you know, the number one reason why they left, they said, you guys don't understand me. Mm. You don't get me. You have never asked me about what I really want for my business. And this is when we shifted over to this whole thing. All right, are we help purpose-driven businesses achieve their vision? And I'm not saying like, I'm not saying this to tout tier 11. I'm just saying it because it shifts the focus away from the agency and the product-based marketing. Like bolt on this Facebook ad thing and that's what it costs. Like if Facebook ads is part of, their service offering, it's highly customized based upon what they have, what they need. Creative is a huge part of that. Media buying, what they have as an internal resource, all of these things. And what we found is that when we, since we started shifting this model, we have like five-star ratings immediately from clients. Like, this is the best experience I've ever had. This is unlike anything that I've ever experienced you know, a couple of these folks have had bad experiences with past agencies, which I get. We hear it all the time. And I'm not saying we're not going to stumble along the way, but it's a complete shift into how we look at things. And it's hard because it's not, it's not templatized. You can't just slap it on. It takes more time to do all these things because it's highly, as you said, customized. Well, what and you I, just said, I think, is an important point to really meditate on, which is we're going to stumble along the way. That's actually the point. What agencies did historically is they figured out one or two or three or 50, whatever it is, things that they do really well. They built the perfect bridge, rock solid bridge. I can get from A to B 
a hundred percent of the time, you know, a thousand times out of a thousand, I can do this without any issues. So I'm going to sell this. I'm going to sell this product. I'm never going to stumble. And what businesses are saying is, Hey, my A to B, you're getting me, your A to B is lives within my A to B maybe, but it's a fraction of the distance. I really need to go, you know, alpha to omega and I need someone who's going to get me there. And what agencies need to be comfortable doing and saying is, cool, I'm going to help figure that out. Now we're going to fall on our face all the damn time mm -hmm. because that's what happens when you're bridging a new gap, when you're paving a new road. You know, this is the Robert Frost agency where it's like, all right, we're going to try this. That didn't work. We're going to try this. That didn't work. We're going to try this. That didn't work. That's a horribly uncomfortable place for an agency to be. Mm -hmm. But it's what the customer wants. It's what mm -hmm. the client needs. It's what the business needs. They need someone who's like, yeah, we're going to help you figure out this thing that's never been done before, which is what makes it non-scalable, but it also makes it so critically important. Because yeah. the minute it's been done before, it's massively commoditized. And because we live in the, the age of scale and commoditization, that becomes a, you know, a, a $90 software, a $9 ebook, uh, a nine cent implementation. There's nothing, there's no value to it. Once, once the problem's been solved, you have to solve problems that haven't been solved yet. Yeah. Yeah. And a, and a, and a part of our solution is, you know, we'll, we'll take on clients now and they say, well, you know, my ultimate goal is to maybe even bring this in house at some point in time, which, you know, is really is the real threat for most traditional agencies, mm -hmm. but you have to be and this is, I, I stated this at the beginning part of this, of 2023. I was like, you know, we've got to be so great that our customers can't live without us. They cannot think of a world without us being in their lives. We have become partners with them. And whether or not it's a revenue share model, which, you know, which we entertain, which is truly, you know, you're, you're in bed. Real with, partnership. Yeah. yeah, that's a real partnership. I find a lot of clients don't want to do that. And that's okay. But we price everything accordingly now, not based upon 15% of ad spend or 18% of ad spend. Like we're, we're in a bidding process right now. And we're on our scoping phase. So we basically do a discovery call. Then we do an audit that says, these are all the things that we noticed are wrong. Then let's do a scoping with you. This is what we think are the best recommendations. Let's work together. And this is an hour call. Sometimes this is over three to four weeks. And the point is, is like every step of the way, we get a better understanding of who they are, what we can do, and what we can bring to the table to ultimately help them, and then lay out a plan that we think for the first 90 days or so, that's going to be reviewed and tweaked and changed all along the way based upon what's best for the client, not what's best for us. And we price it not based upon an ad spend model. That, that model is dead. Like the 15%, 18%, base fee plus 10%, all the different ways in which to do it. I'm partially responsible for it. I mean, I invented the true reverse sliding scale fee schedule, which I know hundreds of agencies that I have coached are still doing to this day. That model sucks because even though it helps the client a little bit, it's unfair to the client. And the client should actually be paying for really the resources that you provide Yes, you should make your profit margin, but you shouldn't gouge. I know at an 18% ad spend, agencies are gouging clients for that. And nobody wants that. And you know what? This is backed up with not just conversations that I've had with clients, but also conversations that I've had. And I know you've had plenty of conversations with private equity groups. Private equity groups are the ones that are now trying to assemble or pull together different agencies and obviously scale up larger agencies, investing those dollars to create arc of services organizations. And they are doing away with it because customers and clients of those agencies don't want it, don't mm. like it. And that's a rebellion. And I think if your model right now is percentage of ad spend, get rid of it. And if you don't, you are, you are not going to survive. I guarantee it as an agency because you will always be considered a vendor and not a partner. And that's the real difference between today's digital marketing landscape. You have to be client centric. You can't be product centric. And, you know, if that means cutting back your bill for one month because you're actually doing less services because they don't really need it, that's what it means. And I think it's the right way. It's the ethical way to do it. And it also helps you and your client establish a level of trust 
so that you can really help them ultimately achieve their vision, which is your goal as an agency. It's not for you just to gouge them and make money. It is to help them grow businesses. At a long meeting with John Moran, you know, your right-hand man is like, what do you love doing? He's like, I love growing businesses. I love it. I can't stop thinking about it. It's like that kind of passion, that kind of enthusiasm. If you don't have that passion, you're in the wrong business. Go sell your agency right now. Get out of the space. You're not even going to be able to sell your agency right now. Try to sell your agency right now. <laughs> you're a freaking bloodbath out there, dude. Like It is. You know, I mean, all, I don't know what you're seeing on your end, but on my end, all nobody's acquisitive anymore. All the peg money's frozen. Everybody's sitting back waiting to see what's going to fall. And, and I mean, there might be certain niches or whatever where stuff's still flying off the shelves, but really feels like a stalemate while we're we're trying to, you know, where where's AI going to go? Where's the market going to go? Um, yeah, I think agencies need to evolve fast. And for those of you that, you know, if, if you're a director of marketing, if you're a CMO, if you're a business owner, it's okay to demand more. It's okay to demand. Yep. And I, I'm not even going to say demand. Like, expect it. it. Yeah, this is the thing that you need. You know, you don't, it, nobody, here's where you go into a doctor and if your doctor pulls out a menu, you know, like here are the 10 surgeries that I can do on you. This is the wrong doctor. Think we about don't want for a second. It's crazy. <laughs> like I was, I was at a party last night and I was talking to a guy who is a contractor and he has some heart issues. And we were talking about, of course, you know, a bunch of like guys my age get together. We all talk about our <laughs> freaking health problems. <laughs> anyway, so we're sitting around. He's like, you're doing a drinking game for how many stints you have. Oh, yeah. How many stints? You go around so, the circles. Yeah. Well, I got two. Uh, so I, he said, he's like, I, I said, well, do you like your doctor? He's like, well, I love my doctor now. I was like, well, what happened to the other one? Well, she would come in and she would say, so uh, you've got high cholesterol. Um, do you think you should go on like a cholesterol lowering agent? And he's like, do, do you I'm think a, I should go? <laughs> I'm a freaking, I'm a contractor yeah. for Christ's sake. Like you're the doctor. And I told him the exact same story. The reason I fired my one cardiologist is because she was like, yeah, like, you know, your uh, lisinopril is at 20. Like maybe we should go up to 40. What do you think? I'm like, I mean, what do I think? Yeah. I mean, I was granted I was in pharma and lab for 20 years. Like, I get it. I can speak doctor, but I'm not the doctor. No, but don't I, hand me the controls. Don't, don't hand I me the controls. Yeah. I, right. I'm like, I got rid of her. I, I, I mean, I really did like her. I mean, she probably saved my life at one point in time. But I guess so I got another doctor. Well, and he's like, no, no, so hold this on. is this, what this you is need to do. interesting, Ralph. Yeah. What you just said. Think about what exactly what you just said. She saved my life at one point in time. At one mm -hmm. point, she was the exact right solution, but I've evolved beyond that solution. Agencies are in the same boat. I have clients whose businesses 100%. only exist because of us. And at the time, we were it. But we were it. things change. And I mean, how loyal can you be when your life is on the line or when your business is on the line? One of our favorite customers of all time. We had for three years, we took them from a, maybe $100,000 in online revenue to oh, way over eight figures. And uh, when the iOS thing came out, they got private equity money and they freaked out. Mm -hmm. And we've kept in touch with them. They loved working with us. Their testimony is still on our website. And, uh, and at that time, we were the best thing for them. Now... They made probably a bad decision going to another agency, which I've since found really didn't work out for them. But what they ultimately did is they built an in-house team. And I talked to their principal last week and he's like, they're crushing it right now. And I'm like, that's great. Yeah. I'm, like, I'm so happy for you. Let me know if I can ever help you. So right now, we are not the right solution for that business. But at that point in time, when they first engaged with us three or four years, like they were with us a long time. And you know, we've done case studies about them here on the show. Point was, it's like it changes over time. It's like the cardiologist like that saved my life. And then all of a sudden I evolved. I needed something better. And you should as a business, as a VP of marketing, a director of marketing, a CEO, if you're listening to this show, you should demand more from your agency. Be nice about it. Or but maybe you don't need an agency anymore. Maybe it is maybe like these don't. guys. Maybe you want to build in-house or maybe you need a, you know, something of a hybrid. It's like maybe you need a hybrid. Yeah. yeah. Maybe you do. But it's about you. What do you need? What's right for you and your goals? 
Yeah. And that's, that's the thing is like, you really do have to think unselfishly now in this day and age, if you're an agency and think about being client centric, ask yourself what's best for them, not what's best for you. Because if you figure out what's best for them, ultimately it will benefit you. You will right. have a good relationship yeah, with it's them. It's enlightened self-interest. It's the, yeah, the 100%. virtue of selfishness on a long enough timeline. Well, I think we've, we've can go on on this we, and we will well, come back we made the to point. this yeah, subject. We're going to get some hate mail. It's and dude, right. here's the other thing too, for small agencies, dear God, am I rooting for you? Like I don't, I, I, and I really mean this. I know that we say a lot of things about like, oh, there's too many in the consolidation or whatever, but I know what it's like to be a small business owner. I know what it's like to, honestly, I know what it's like to not know what I'm doing. Yep. And then to hear these two yahoos on a podcast being like, oh, we probably need less agencies. Like I, I, that's, that's cavalier with people's lives. I want you to be successful as long as your success contributes to other people's success. The minute it starts taking away, it becomes predatory and parasitic and you have to go. So we're rooting for you within the confines of what's good for our collective environment. Absolutely. And maybe this is a wake-up call for you, if that's the case. Oh, dude, it I was mean, for is, me. This is to tough. Rebuild my whole damn agency. This is tough love. Yeah. You know? But I think this is the way that it's going. And... You know, and I see it on my last point. I see it. I know this is happening because of the amount of emails I get every single week from other agency owners wanting to partner with us. <laughs> yeah. And that's a crazy thing yeah. now. So anyway, if you are interested and you are an agency and you do have this model, I'm always willing to talk. I'm not soliciting. But the point is, is I see a lot of that right now. And I think it's a sign of the times. So um we are uh, at time here. Make sure that you do check out uh, us over at our YouTube channel, perpetualtraffic.com forward slash YouTube. Check us out there. Things grown like a weed, which is great. Of course, subscribe and leave a rating wherever you're listening in the interest of winning that traffic and conversion summit $2, ticket. $2,000 value. It's a $2,000 value. Come hang out with me and Ralph. Yeah, Ralph, hang out. Beer. That's right. You'll see how you'll see how much taller Kasim in real life actually is than me. It's like he's like three heads taller. So it's yeah. kind of funny. I'm sort of like a midget and he's, you know, on stilts. Uh, so that'll be fun. So make sure you do leave a rating for that and check us out on our socials. Uh, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn, Kasim at Kasim Aslam on all the other socials. We'll leave some links in the show notes to some of our previous episodes here. And uh, of course, you can get all that over at perpetualtraffic.com. So, on behalf of my awesome co host, Kasim Aslam, peace. Until next show, see ya. <laughs>